Okay, so what if an eye disease could slowly steal your vision, and you wouldn't notice or feel a thing until it was too late? As a board-certified doctor of optometry, I unfortunately see these common eye diseases every single week. So in today's episode, I'm going to share what these common eye diseases are, the warning signs that you want to be aware of, and what you can do to prevent them. So disease number one is that of amblyopia, otherwise known as lazy eye. And the reason I want to start with this one is because it's one of the most common causes of pediatric vision loss, and largely is preventable as long as it's caught early enough. Amblyopia is a developmental type of vision loss, which usually occurs because of either a misalignment issue, such as a kid being cross-eyed, a refractive error difference between the two eyes, such as a kid being more farsighted in one eye compared to the other, or from a deprivation issue, such as a child being born with a congenital cataract, for example. What's fascinating is that amblyopia isn't really as much of a problem with the eye as it is an issue with poor development of the visual processing centers of the brain that communicate with the affected eye. And that's why young kids are more susceptible to this, because during the first few years of life, that's where our brain not only develops rapidly, but also our visual processing centers get more hardwired at that stage. The challenge, of course, is that young kids won't speak up and tell you that they are not seeing as well out of one eye. In fact, young infants can't speak at all, and so this may be developing for several years before you ever realize something's wrong. So the best way to prevent this is to have early eye and vision examinations by a professional. Yes, school screenings are good. However, by the time a child's old enough to do a school screening, it's usually already too late. Treatment for amblyopia includes not only corrective eyeglasses, but occlusion therapy, atropine eye drop medications, as well as forms of vision therapy. And sometimes for children who have an eye turn, even forms of eye surgery to correct to that eye turn is needed. But I'll add here that if you are a parent or a guardian of a young child, and if you haven't seen my previous video that I did on pediatric eye exams, like what to expect, what all the tests that we do, uh, then definitely check out that video, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes for you. We even go over how often a child should be seen for pediatric eye exams. Now, disease number two is that of myopia or nearsightedness. And this can be somewhat self-explanatory, but this is where somebody can't see very well far away and requires to wear some form of optical correction to see in the distance, but they see just fine up close without wearing anything like glasses, for example. Now, myopia is an issue for two big reasons. One is that as somebody becomes more nearsighted or myopic, the eyeball actually stretches out in the back and becomes a bit thinner. And this increases the risk for many other eye diseases, including that of glaucoma, cataracts, retinal detachment, as well as retinal degeneration, which all carry risk for reduced vision and permanent vision loss. And the other issue is that myopia is becoming not only more common, but also to greater severity. In fact, around the globe, it's estimated that if nothing's done about this, that about 50% of the world's population will be nearsighted by 2050. Now, of course, early warning signs of myopia is that distance vision uh, becomes more blurred and harder to see. Uh, for example, a young child may not be able to see a whiteboard or a blackboard at school very well, and an adult may have trouble seeing road signs in the distance. And of course, treatment for myopia includes corrective eyeglasses, contact lenses, LASIK, or other forms of refractive surgery for adults. But research has thankfully been showing us ways that we can help slow down the progression of myopia, and even in some cases, hopefully stop it in its tracks, because we don't want the eye to keep elongating, increasing the risk for these other eye diseases. Now again, we've done a whole video series about myopia and kind of strategies to slow it down and prevent it, but kind of the key takeaways includes one, having young children spend at least two hours a day outside, because we know that kids who spend more time indoors, especially doing near tasks like reading or playing on digital devices, they are more likely to become nearsighted. Uh, it's also recommended to take more frequent breaks when they are doing near activities, including doing homework, reading, writing, those sort of things. 
In addition to this, we now have myopia management strategies that can be prescribed by an eye care professional to help slow down the progression of myopia, especially, again, in young children. This can include not only specialized prescription eyeglasses that can slow down myopia, there's specialized contact lenses, both soft and hard, rigid gas permeable, or known as ortho-K contact lenses. There's also new medications, forms of atropine eye drops that may be able to help, as well as some research looking into things like red light therapy. However, at least in terms of red light therapy, the research on that is still kind of speculative and they're being very cautious about safety and use of red light therapy for myopia. And I'll just add that this hits home a little bit more for me because although I had eye surgery already, right, I had ICL implants put in my eyes, I am more severely nearsighted. And so my eyeball has elongated and my risk for a lot of the eye diseases that we're going to be mentioning in today's episode, I have a higher risk for these conditions. And so I think it's just really important to be aware of this, especially if you are a parent or a guardian yourself, or perhaps you plan on having kids in the future. This is all important information. Now, disease number three is that of dry eye disease. Now, this one might surprise some people, but dry eye disease is actually quite a big issue. The prevalence data is all over the place, but we know that not only is dry eye affecting a lot more people than we once thought, but it's also affecting younger individuals too. Now, dry eye disease is not just that you don't make enough tears. For some people, that can be the issue. They physically don't make enough tears on the eye. But for a lot of people, it's that their tear film is poor quality and is unstable, or it's a mix of the two. But either way, it leads to ocular surface damage, so damage to the front surface of the eye, as well as fluctuating blurry vision. And unfortunately for some people, it can cause significant pain on the eyeball and causing vision distortion that just makes life really, really challenging. Early warning signs or symptoms of dry eye disease don't only just include the kind of dry, gritty foreign body sensation, but burning of the eyes, but also fluctuation in vision or vision kind of coming in and out of focus. And paradoxically, some people may experience not dryness, but more of wetness. Their eyes seem to tear up in water occasionally. And this can actually be a symptom of dry eye disease because as the surface of the eye becomes dry and damaged, the body recognizes this and tries to fix it itself by reflex tearing and creating more tears. To prevent getting dry eye disease, it's largely focused around just lifestyle things, right? Blinking more often and consciously, especially when using digital devices, uh, wearing eye protection in windy environments and avoiding huge changes in humidity, but also to treat any dryness early on, you know, not ignoring the signs and symptoms, but instead being more proactive about treating it early to prevent it from getting to a severe stage. Dry eye disease is actually very complex, and there's many different causes for dry eye. However, the good news is that we do have many different treatments for it now, well beyond just using artificial tears. Uh, this includes prescription medications that doctors can prescribe, both eye drops as well as uh, like nasal sprays and a lot of different type cool treatments. But then also there's in-office procedures, things that can help reduce inflammation in the eyelids and on the ocular surface. These things can provide a lot of relief for people with dry eye. Now, disease number four is that of cataracts. Cataracts is the clouding of the lens inside of the eye that results in not only blurred vision, but glare issues as well as contrast issues. And cataracts are super common. It's estimated that about 40 million Americans will have a cataract in at least one eye by 2030 and remains one of the most significant causes of reversible blindness globally. Unfortunately, most people won't recognize that they're even developing a cataract, especially early on. Some of the early symptoms include that of progressively blurry vision, but also problems with glare and halos, especially in low light, and then difficulty with color vision and even more challenges when reading up close. Now, in order to try and prevent cataracts from developing, uh, the best recommendations include that of wearing UV light protection, such as sunglasses when you're outside, but also reducing risk of things like diabetes, but also reducing any smoking or heavy alcohol consumption. Also, eating a healthy diet that has a lot of antioxidants, because uh, eating more antioxidants may help reduce the risk of some eye diseases, including cataracts. 
But the good news is that when vision is deteriorated due to a cataract, then thankfully cataract surgery is not only effective, but is considered one of the most successful surgeries that exist. This is where the cataract is removed from inside of the eye and replaced with a new plastic lens implant that usually is calculated to help correct for any need for glasses and things like that. If you are actually thinking about cataract surgery, maybe in the next few years or want to learn more about that, uh, I did do a video breaking down some of the most current technologies in the type of lens implants that are inserted during that cataract surgery. And again, I'll put a, a link to that in the show notes for you. But cataracts does remain a common cause of vision loss worldwide, and while it is considered largely a normal thing to develop as we get older, some people do get cataracts at a younger age, whether it be due to medication, trauma, or even some children are born with congenital cataracts too. Now, disease number five is that of diabetic retinopathy. This is when damage occurs to the fine blood vessels in the back of the eye, usually due to chronic elevated blood sugars. This results in not only hemorrhaging, but swelling of the back of the eye, as well as potential new blood vessel growth and retinal detachments and scarring, which can lead to not only decreased function of the retina, but also permanent vision loss. Here in the US, it's estimated that around 10 million Americans have some form of this, and globally, it's around 25% of everybody with diabetes has some form of active retinopathy. The challenge is that early diabetic retinopathy is asymptomatic. And so a lot of people don't even know that there's an issue going on. They could be bleeding inside of the eye and they won't know that there's a problem. And part of that is because there's no pain receptors in the back of the eye, but also because uh, the vision changes that may occur are so small, they're often not appreciated. So it's not uncommon for somebody to come in to the, have a, just a routine eye exam for me to be checking for things like glasses and to look at the health of their eye for me to tell them, hey, you're actually bleeding in the back of the eye and now I need to send you to different blood work tests and send you back to your family doctor because there's a strong likelihood that they may in fact have diabetes. Other symptoms of diabetic retinopathy that people may experience uh, not only includes that of blurred vision, but new floaters or dark spots in their vision and unfortunately vision loss. The best ways to prevent getting diabetic retinopathy includes not only tight glycemic control, but tight blood pressure control. And then of course, having regular dilated diabetic eye exams with an eye care professional. If more severe forms of diabetic retinopathy does occur in an individual, then there are some treatments that are available, including injections in the back of the eye. Sometimes laser is used in the back of the eye. But then also there are some new medications, uh, such as even eye drops and, and oral medications that uh, are being investigated right now in the research. Some eye doctors may even recommend a diabetic vision supplement to help support vascular integrity and improve retinal function. And again, I'll include some additional links and resources for you in the show notes if you want to learn more. Now, eye disease number six is that of age-related macular degeneration, otherwise known as AND. This is when there is a degeneration of the central part of the retina in the back of the eye called the macula. This results in not only loss of vision in the central part of your eyesight, but this is the part that you use for things like reading and recognizing faces. And unfortunately, this is actually way more common than people realize. And it's estimated even back in 2019 that about 20 million Americans have some form of AMD. And with the population not only getting older, but living longer, uh, the rates of this are only gonna go up. And what really sucks about this is that AMD can affect people even as early in their 40s and 50s. But as we get older, it becomes even more and more prevalent, which just stinks because a lot of people will save off doing things in their lifetime until they retire. But then, you know, if they get this condition after they retire, then unfortunately they may not be able to do a lot of the activities that they previously enjoyed, whether that be reading, sightseeing, or even just taking care of uh, young grandchildren and recognizing their faces. That can be a real challenge. Now there's two different types of macular degeneration. There's either dry AMD or there's wet AMD, otherwise known as neovascular. And the neovascular AMD is when the new tiny blood vessels grow inside the eye that are very fragile and they leak fluid. And when this happens, someone gets really fast deteriorating vision. And oftentimes the only treatment we have for that is an injection of medications inside of the eye, which is really effective, but Sadly, um, you know, again, no one wants to get an injection inside of the eye. 
early warning signs of macular degeneration actually include first not being able to see very well in dim light, which can sometimes be difficult because like driving at nighttime is difficult for everyone. But then also having distortion in your central vision, such as straight lines starting to look wavy. Also having increasingly blurry vision with maybe spots missing from central vision. But oftentimes early in the disease, people do not know that anything's going on. And usually eye doctors are the first one to notice that something is changing inside of the eye. And so more frequent eye exams, especially as we get older, is strongly recommended. Otherwise, in order to prevent AMD, uh, the recommendations include one, don't smoke, two, uh, wear sunlight protection when you're outside, such as sunglasses, three is to eat really healthy, especially eating lots of green leafy vegetables and oily fish, as research has shown that that can even decrease the incidence and progression of AMD by up to about 40%. And then of course, having regular routine eye examinations once you're over the age of 40. Now disease number seven is that of glaucoma, which is actually a group of eye diseases where the optic nerve in the back of the eye gets damaged and slowly dies over time. This is usually associated with elevated pressure inside of the eye where the pressure goes up and pushes on the nerve and again slowly kills it, which can result in a progressive loss of someone's side vision, which if goes untreated can eventually lead to snuffing out the central part of the vision. Now in just 2022, it was reported that about 4 million Americans have some form of glaucoma, but globally remains one of the most common causes of permanent or irreversible blindness. What sucks about glaucoma is it's kind of considered the silent killer of vision because usually people do not experience or feel elevated pressure inside of their eye. And you don't notice that you're having any sort of side vision loss until it's already too late and a lot of the nerve has already been damaged or, or killed off at that point. And the only ways that you can really catch a glaucoma and start to prevent it is to have regular eye exams where we can check the eye pressure but also evaluate the health of the nerve in the back of the eye. And so sadly, people who don't have regular eye exams, they're at high risk of this going on and then they finally come in because, hey, they can't see and it's unfortunately too late and there's no way for us to fix it. If somebody does come in and their eye pressures are elevated or they do have a diagnosis of glaucoma, uh, then usually the first treatments that we prescribe are either laser procedures to reduce the pressure or prescription medications, or in severe cases, then even some more invasive surgeries to lower the eye pressure are needed. Prevention for glaucoma revolves, of course, around having regular eye exams and regular eye pressure checks, but then a lot of lifestyle modifications, really focused around getting regular physical activity and good health diets as good blood flow to the optic nerve may be more supportive. There's also some studies showing that reducing stress biomarkers, mainly through doing that of meditation and certain breathing exercises, may also reduce the risk for eye pressure issues uh, and more healthy optic nerve integrity. But then also more current research, even ongoing clinical trials right now, looking at taking vitamin B3 supplements and or niacinamide may add a metabolic support to the optic nerve in preventing vision loss from glaucoma. Uh, I did a whole video on the niacinamide and vitamin B3. Uh, if you want to learn more about that, again, I'll, I'll put that in the resources below. Okay, so that was our episode for today. From here, I would love to hear from you in the comments section, like your key takeaway from today's episode, but also if there's anything else uh, that you've heard either in previous videos or anything else you've heard from your eye doctor on ways to prevent various eye diseases. I'd love to see that. But if you'd like to learn more about how to not only protect your eyesight, but also see your very best, then I encourage you to check out our Dr. Eye Health newsletter. The newsletter we put out every single week, which not only keeps you updated on what we are doing and posting, but also on new research and new products that are coming out in the eye care space. We also include special discounts for either eye drops or sunglasses, different things that are coming available as well. To sign up for that newsletter, you can either go to our website or I'll also put a link to it at the top of our show notes. Either way, I want to say thank you so much for joining us here today. Again, Dr. Allen here from Dr. Eye Health. Keep an eye on it, and we'll see you in that next video.